long history. Just so you know. History of education to people like us and people all over her county and elsewhere on some basic subjects. And certainly this subject is very basic. <laughs> um, I, I read a, an article in the Times this morning about what's going to happen if they drain Lake Powell out west and the sea of mud that will be out there. And I'm thinking, well, Maine has a lot of mud right now. And the mud is exactly where the weeds get started before we even begin to think of planting seeds outside. Anyway, Donna, it's thank you for coming to us. You were very wise to say that you would like to come remotely <laughs> this month of March, this unpredictable month of March. Um, and we, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Okay, you can share your screen now. Yep. Okay, can you see it okay? I'll start the PowerPoint program. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm actually in the Bangor office uh, as we speak. Um, and uh, you folks wanted to hear about weeds. I can't understand why uh, anyone would have trouble with weeds. Uh, weeds and weed control methods. Um, and I will mention, I do have some uh, uh, handouts and some uh, resources that I can send by email. So you folks that are listening uh, on Zoom, if you put your email address in the chat, if you just chat to me, the other folks won't see it. Uh, and for you folks in the room, uh, Susan or uh, Barb are going to uh, get your emails to me or I'll send the uh, uh, resources to them and they can forward it to you, where, but we'll figure it out. But they need to get your email somehow. And I think uh, they said that they might have them uh, someplace. But anyway, why don't we get started? So weeds, uh, has anybody ever seen any of these weeds? <laughs> I see some nods. Uh, anybody want to guess what they are? We can shout something out uh, in the room and, and you folks online can, can chat. I see purse lane and lamb's quarters. Uh-huh. Good. I don't know what the other two are. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I bet you do. I bet you're going to look uh, this summer and you're going to see this gallon soga. If you have any soils that are bare, uh, it comes right up. We'll talk about that quite a bit. Uh, common ragweed uh, and purslane and lamb's quarter. Uh, but I like to stop a moment and think about, so, well, what is a weed? And when you look at this list of plants, uh, sometimes people would focus on the bottom one, yellow rock and say, that's the only weed that's there. But the thing is, a weed is uh, just a plant that's growing in a place that we don't want it to grow in. And so if you have a, a field of corn and you've got a tomato plant out there, the tomato plant is acting like a weed. So it's all a perspective of, uh, you know, where, uh, uh, what we're thinking about as a weed. Uh, and not all weeds are bad. Um, well, you wait a minute. There we go. Oh, I'm having trouble. It doesn't want to uh, forward. Mm -hmm. There we go, okay. I was gonna say, uh, sometimes things that we think of as weeds are, can actually be beneficials. Uh, and sometimes we really appreciate the flowers, sometimes they're edible, uh, sometimes they're, they're uh, bee habitat or other insect habitat, you know, desirable insects. Uh, sometimes I just went to a spinning uh, session Saturday and there was somebody there that was using plants as natural dyes. Uh, sometimes the long roots will bring up elements from deep in the soil and sometimes they can 
can indicate a problem. Uh, but the, the plant in the background is sometimes it's known as butter and eggs. And I used to have a big strawberry field and we did pick your own strawberries. And this was one of our tougher weeds, or I shouldn't say tougher. It was one of the prolific weeds. And I used to have people come and pick strawberries and say, oh, do you mind if I take some of those beautiful flowers? And I'd <laughs> say, take as many as you want. You can actually dig them up and take them home, but be <laughs> warned, they will take over. Mm -hmm. So weeds can be, uh, a uh, can be a disadvantage in the garden and uh, they can compete for nutrients and water and you know all this other stuff, shading crops and, and uh, uh, can spew out seeds to, to uh, grow another year. And actually the same crop can be a weed within that crop. So if we, uh, the, the line drawing at the top there is just showing if you uh, spread too many radish seeds, then some of the radishes are acting as weeds to the other radishes. So we have to thin them out. Uh, so, you know, uh, weeds are, it's just a perspective of how we, we look at that. So uh, one adage that I've heard over the years is one year's weed equals seven years seed. And that means if you don't control the seeds in one year, you're gonna see them again for at least seven years. Uh, but looking at this chart, uh, some weeds are really prolific, meaning they set out a lot of seeds and some weeds uh, have a, their seeds have a really long longevity. And uh, I highlighted the common mullen, that's what that picture is right there. It can spew out over 220,000 seeds on one plant. And those seeds could last 39 years. So it's like, that's what you might be up against. Um, but, so you might think, well, how come the earth isn't covered with mullen plants? Not all those seeds will survive. Uh, and uh, after they've spewed out on the, the soil, uh, they're subject to predation by insects and birds. And sometimes when we're seeding the lawn, you know, if you don't cover the seed, you might see birds out there eating the lawn seed. Well, they, they'll eat weed seeds too. Uh, and sometimes when they start to germinate, they'll just fail for a, a variety of reasons. Either we planted them, they got planted too deep uh, or pathogens uh, overcame them or just not the right environmental conditions. Sometimes they're damaged and we damage uh, weed seedlings by hoeing and other types of things. And sometimes they have a physiological death. They, they uh, uh, just can't survive. Uh, the other thing, thing up on the uh, upper right, it talks about seeds can come in. I had the seed rain from the plant, but we can also bring seeds in or bring weeds into our lawn if, if we're not careful about, um, like when we go to a, 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 a plant sale and somebody has just dug up the plants from their infested uh, flower bed and they'll share the joy with you. So you have to be careful. Uh, about bringing seeds into your uh, garden area. And weeds, just like any plant, are uh, come in a, a number of categories, or we think of them as, as different categories. Uh, they're annuals, biennials, fixed perennials, and wandering perennials. And uh, those terms are based on how long it takes them to reproduce. So an annual, within one year, it will germinate, grow, flower, set seed, and spew the seed out. Uh, the biennials, uh, they take two years. They usually grow, and I've got some examples of all of these, but they'll grow one year just vegetatively, and then the second year they shoot up a flower stalk, set seed, and spew out seed. The fixed perennials, once they start flowering, they can uh, survive the winter. And so they're, they're surviving the winter and they're spewing seeds out uh, at the same time. So for many years. 
Wandering perennials, not only do they spew seeds out, but they can spread by underground roots and shoots. Uh, you know, so they have a, a double whammy. Uh, and uh, depending on, on uh, uh, their annual cycle or biennial cycle, their, their life cycle, uh, their seed longevity might be less and less. So those wandering perennials, they don't need to have their seeds last as long. Uh, so they're uh, a little bit uh, shorter lived. Uh, and um, I was going to say that the way that they disperse, it's like in the soil. If uh, some seeds can go right through animals, uh, herbivores, and uh, we get manure that hasn't been treated, uh, hasn't been heated uh, enough, and, and we can be spreading seed on our lawns or our gardens too. Sometimes the wind uh, can spread the seeds. And down at the bottom are some examples of uh, annuals, biennials, fixed perennials, and wandering perennials. We'll, I've got some pictures of those in a moment. So steps to controlling weeds. The first thing is to identify what is that weed? And we had, uh, some of you weren't familiar with all of those first four that I had showed you. So uh, learning to identify weeds. And a, a gardener should be able to site identify like at least 10 weeds. And once you get 10, then you can, can grow from there. Uh, but why it's important to know what the weed is, then we know we can know, well, how does it, how does it spread? Uh, and uh, how long does it live? Uh, so it will give us some ideas of, of how to control them, the timing that is needed to control them. And uh, then once, once we get our weeds under control, we may need to uh, reestablish uh, our, our vegetable garden or flower uh, bed uh, once the, the weeds have got, been gotten under control. Sometimes we can control them with our desirable plants. And this table, uh, I used to do a, a weed ID session, a weed walk, we called it. Uh, and uh, people would go out into a field and we'd gather weeds and we'd sit around with resources and figure out as a group what the different weeds were. That might be an activity that you could do in your garden club. Uh, and through the years, I've used a variety of things, resources to identify plants. And these are some of the books and I'll send you a, a list of these books. Uh, and, um, they, it comes in handy. They uh, uh, have really nice pictures in them. Uh, you can take them out into the field, uh, you know, so they're really handy. Um, but a lot of us have smartphones and tablets, and we've learned that there are apps, app mm -hmm. applications that we can download, and they may be able to uh, identify what the weeds are. Well, one of my colleagues in uh, uh, Michigan has been doing uh, research on this and they get their students to go out and identify a number of weeds that, or a number of plants that they have, uh, that they know what they are. And they try a variety of these apps and they found that only 67, they're only 67% accurate, the best of one. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it, it can aim you in the right direction. And to get 100% uh, accuracy, the app needs to get the uh, Latin genus and the species. So sometimes they get it half right. You know, they get the genus maybe, but not the species. But so it can, can help you uh, uh, hone down in uh, to what that is. And this is how the different... Uh, apps that they looked at in the fall of 2021. Uh, and picture this uh, was the, the uh, one that got 67% uh, correct. Uh, PlantNet was another one that did pretty well, uh, about 50%. Plant Story, and you can see these others, uh, LeafSnap. I used to use LeafSnap all the time. Uh, I naturalist people, I, I think in other years, I naturalist did a better job. Uh, so these, their accuracy changes with a year too. So it's just something to think about. And uh, as I 
uh, now I'm using Picture This and Leaf Snap. And if you use two different methods of identifying a plant, you may be more accurate than just using one method. So you could use uh, an app to get close to uh, the identification, and then you could use a book to, to verify it. Or you could use, there are a bunch of websites now too. So not only are there apps, but there are websites. And I like the USDA plants. Uh, uh, it will give you the uh, range of the plant um, and you can search for common names or Latin names. Uh, the next one I like is Go Botany, uh, the Native Plant Trust. Uh, and it has a, a little bit of a key that you can go into, but if you, if you can get close to it uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a, a simple common name search, you might be able to find it. And uh, these are some others. And that Weeds of the Northeast, that was a paper book I showed you, that's also available online. And just to show you what the Go Botany is, this is kind of neat because it will give you the New England distribution of a particular plant. Now this is purslane and you'll notice uh, Piscataquis and uh, Somerset County and Washington County. It says that it hasn't been found there. It hasn't been documented. And uh, as a garden club, if you wanted to, you could go through and see, uh, you know, if there's a plant that you find in the, the summertime that hasn't been documented, they like to have you show the, the leaf form of it, the flower form, and if there are any fruits. Uh, and uh, you can go in, there's a place that you can uh, put in the pictures and uh, you can get uh, maybe more of the plants in your county uh, identified and documented. And sometimes people want to know, well, is it invasive plant? And you'll notice right there, uh, Japanese knotweed is a notorious one for being uh, called invasive. Uh, and an invasive plant is uh, not native uh, and it can cause some economic or environmental ha harm. And uh, there's also a map that you can help map out invasives in your town. And this is a picture of Dover Foxcroft and those blue dot or those uh, green dots rather are actually honeysuckle uh, that people, someone has identified. Uh, so that's a, another thing that you might consider doing as a, uh, a garden club. And the other thing people wanna know is, is it poisonous? And, uh, and I, I just put on the dose makes the poison, you know, so, uh, just a little bit of something, you know, maybe it's a poisonous plant, but it's like, how poisonous is it? How much do you have to eat? Uh, and there are, uh, uh, for human, if you've had somebody ha that has eaten a plant or a berry or something like that, you want to contact the uh, Northern New England Poison Control Center. And of course, if you can, it's important that you try to identify it. Uh, there are sites available for livestock and pets, uh, and I'll be sending these links to you too. Uh, and the North Carolina State University has a nice site uh, that if you know either, if you know the, the uh, Latin name, uh, it can bring you right to that plant uh, to help you identify it if it's going to be poisonous to your, your pets or your livestock. Now, I, I told you about all those ways that you can identify plants. Well, University of Maine Cooperative Extension does have a method that you can get your plants identified. And that's the website you go to. It's the Ask the Expert site. And when you go to that site, uh, if you click that you have uh, a plant to identify, it opens up these other questions uh, that we ask you uh, to try to get an idea of you know, where it was found, uh, the type of site, the growing conditions, how tall it is. Is it just one plant or is your whole field infested? Uh, you know, is it a tree, a shrub, a, a vine? Is there anything uh, distinctive? Uh, why you want an ID? You know, we have a lot of people that they're just curious. And we have others that say, this is the number one problem in my garden and I want to get it under control. You do need to uh, attach some photos, uh, up to three photos, and you have a one megabyte uh, max uh, limit on the photos. 
and it, it will take a few days and somebody will get back to you. And if we can't tell what it is, we'll, we might ask for better photos or something like that. Uh, if we can tell uh, what it is, then we can uh, give you some direction on uh, some ideas on how to manage it. Okay. Anybody know what this is? I can't see the chat, so. No guesses, it's barnyard grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing that's key about this grass is the stem is flat or it's, it's kind of a pinched oval shape. Uh, it has that real, really robust seed head. It's really coarse seed. Uh, it's a summer annual and you'll see this covering manure piles a lot of times. And, uh, you know, a farmer might say, yeah, I'll take as much manure as you want. And yeah, it's old aged manure and you see all the stuff on top of it. Well, that's been spewing seeds out. So you'll be getting uh, some barnyard grass seed. Uh, and you'll notice I, I try to include, you know, it needs light and warmth to germinate. It only germinates in that top inch of soil. If it's compacted, the soil's compacted, it increases the seedlings emergence from the deep soil. Uh, and it doesn't like shade. So that's an important thing to remember. It doesn't like shade. Well, here's one of those uh, plants from the first four and it's called Galen Soga. And we mentioned it, it's a summer annual. The seeds are only viable for one to two years. So it should be pretty easy to control you'd think. Uh, but uh, and the seeds just germinate right near the surface of the soil. But the thing is, once the seeds germinate, once it sends one leaf out, it's like sending the, the flowers out and it's reseeding almost immediately. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to get it under control uh, because it reseeds so quickly. Uh, it needs light and warmth to germinate. Uh, if it's dry, if the soil surface is dry, uh, it's sensitive, it can't germinate as well. Um, so it's, it's very prolific. Let's look at, uh, for the annual weeds, if we have uh, annuals, we talked about the, the seeds and how the seeds can have fatal germination or seed predation or lose their vi viability by themselves. Uh, once the seedlings form, uh, then we can hit them with cultivation or flame weeding. I got a picture of that. Uh, uh, sometimes the seedlings are eaten by other things. Uh, sometimes disease will get them. And sometimes there's just too many weed seedlings. And so they compete with each other. Once the plants get a little bit bigger, then we need to, we can do cultivation. We may do mowing depending on what type of a planting it is. And once they're big, huge, uh, mature plants, uh, late cultivation, pulling the whole plant out uh, and thinking about post-harvest tillage are uh, contro weed control methods uh, that we can uh, think about. Uh, with the, the very tiny seedlings, it's the, uh, once they're up to two inches, that's when we can flame uh, weed them. Uh, but the bigger plants, that flame weeding doesn't, uh, won't work on them. Okay, so this one is kind of hard to see. It's uh, Queen Anne's Lace, and this is the biennial. And I bet if you've been by a, a field uh, that hasn't been uh, harvested for hay, uh, you may have seen this. Uh, uh, this is a lot of butterflies will land on the flower head uh, and uh, gather nectar and, and that type of thing. Uh, the seeds, they'll germinate through the season, but they only form a rosette right next to the ground. Uh, and it's kind of ferny. You can kind of see the, the ferny leaf there uh, halfway up the pitcher. Uh, and then it will send up a flower stalk and it flowers in the second season. Uh, if it's in your garden, if it's in your, your perennial garden, you'll probably see it in the perennial garden. Uh, the easiest time to control it is when it's in the rosette stage. In our vegetable garden, if we're tilling it every season, uh, you aren't going to see it uh, because it's not going to uh, be able to flower. We will have controlled it 
uh, through cultivation. Okay, who hasn't seen a dandelion out in their lawns? And uh, I know we have this thing coming up, uh, the no mo may, and the idea is to have more uh, flowers for pollinators and that dandelions certainly provide a lot of food for pollinators. Uh, but you see those little seeds and the, they start blowing, they're gonna blow right into our desirable uh, garden beds, whether they're, they're vegetable or uh, perennial flowers, and they're gonna establish themselves there. And we used to have a lot of trouble with uh, dandelions in the strawberry fields because those seeds, when they're blowing along, the plant, the strawberry plant would catch them and they'd fall down and they'd seed right next to the strawberry plant. So it was really hard to separate them, hard to, hard to uh, pull them out of the soil. Uh, they germinate again in that top inch of soil. Uh, they do have a high requirement for potassium, but don't think that potassium deficient soil will prevent dandelion growth. They'll still grow. Uh, the small seedlings are sensitive to straw mulch, meaning they can't come up through the mulch, but once they get to a certain point and the leaves get sun, then they can come right up through it. If we damage the roots in the soil, uh, you know, through tillage, each of those root fragments can emerge uh, from two to four inches of soil. So that it's a pretty robust plant. Okay, anybody seen this? Look at those roots. I want you to look very carefully at those roots. They actually get so sharp that they can penetrate a potato. And so that it's called quack grass and uh, different areas of the country have different names for different plants. That's why if we can learn the Latin names of a plant, sometimes we can communicate with gardeners in other parts of the country. Uh, some uh, parts of the country call this couch grass. And some, there are uh, some people that quack grass is a term they use for a number of different types of grasses. So uh, sometimes we have to say quack grass, that's the, the grass that has the rhizomes, uh, you know, that's spread by rhizomes, just to double check that we're talking about the same plant. Uh, so deep plowing uh, sometimes uh, can help reduce the rhizomes. That's meaning you're burying them, uh, uh, you know, four to six inches in the ground. Uh, repeated tillage can also help uh, deplete the rhizomes. And here's a, just a picture showing if we, if we break up those roots, I did mention that each of those little roots will grow little plants. Um, but if we continuously till, uh, then we'll eventually be able to deplete the, the root sto energy stores and they'll die off. Now at this point, somebody usually says, but Continuous tillage of soil isn't good. And it's true, it's not good. You'll destroy the, the uh, uh, soil structure by uh, continuously tilling. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, so that, so that uh, um, can be an issue. Um, but we're lucky that we live in Maine and when we do something to destroy our soil structure, uh, we have a winter when the soil freezes and through that freezing and thawing, it will like uh, make the soil good again. It will, we'll be able to be forgiven for our uh, soil tillage dis discretions, indiscretions. Okay, I'll stop a moment. Are there any questions before I, head into con weed control methods. We just talked about how to get them up, the plants identified. Now we'll talk about some of the weed control methods and these are the methods we'll be going through. Okay, hearing nothing, I'll carry on. So how we control weeds, it depends on how we grow our desirable plants. And in a vegetable garden, a conventional row garden, 
this is the way that a lot of farmers use and a lot of gardeners, vegetable gardeners use. It's really easy to organize. It's quick to lay out, very efficient for large plantings, but we have a large area that weeds can grow. And so the more bare space you have, the more weeds you have, and also the less yield per area. <clears throat> The next type of garden we're looking at is raised beds, and it can raised bed can mean a number of different things, usually just wide row, and you don't need to put wood around it to make a raised bed. You can just heap it up. Uh, here's a three foot wide uh, on the top uh, that they just pull the soil from the alleyways up into the soil bed. Um, and you see there are also uh, raised beds that uh, they've made frames around and also a really raised bed, uh, you know, three feet high for somebody that has trouble uh, bending over. And if you uh, put that on a solid surface, somebody in a wheelchair can actually get their knees in there and are able to garden. Uh, <clears throat> they are a lot more work to establish. Uh, they're more efficient meaning you're gonna get more yield per area. They're a lot easier to weed because they're a little bit higher up. They drain better, which can be a good thing. Uh, they warm up quicker in the springtime. Uh, the draining better is good when we have a lot of rain and also in the spring because the uh, drier soils warm up faster. But during the summertime, when we have, we'll have a, another short drought, I'm sure. Uh, so those raised, raised beds will dry out quicker too. Uh, so may need more water. And when we're doing raised beds, we tend to do close spacing. And uh, uh, there's also another term, uh, square foot gardening has been around probably 25, at least 25 years. And with this, it's the idea is to crowd out the weeds. If you have our desirable crop, if the leaves of our desirable crop are shading the soil surface, then the weed seeds are less apt to germinate. Uh, so we're trying to shade the soil surface. Uh, if we plant them too close together, they are more susceptible to disease because the leaves don't dry out as quickly. And, uh, you know, so. There's a, uh, you have to reach a happy medium. Uh, if you start getting some disease development, you probably will have to thin out your desirable plants. If you have lettuce, uh, like in the upper picture, uh, then uh, pulling out uh, every other plant, uh, that's what you can eat for supper. Uh, so it might not be a bad thing. Containers is the really small uh, space. Uh, it can be uh, just a pot. Uh, but you can see this pot, I've put it on uh, wheels so you can actually wheel it in if the frost is coming or cold weather is coming. Uh, very few weeds, but it requires a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer. Uh, so it takes a lot more uh, daily care or weekly care uh, than other types of plants. Let's look at cultivation, uh, uh, cultural controls. Uh, first, we think about Sanitation, and that means when you pull a weed out of the, the soil, take it off the, the uh, garden area, and also don't bring in other soil that may be, uh, has weed seeds or pieces of, of uh, plants uh, that could um, infest our, our garden soil. Uh, rotations means, uh, you know, different parts of the garden will grow different things in different years. And that can actually help with insect life cycles uh, and uh, as well as getting the weeds under control. Uh, we can also uh, plant cover crops in the areas when we're doing a rotation. Uh, so you're giving the, the soils a rest. Uh, you're giving them a nutrient source with a, a cover crop plant that will till in. Uh, so it has a lot of benefits. There are some companion plants, you've heard of interplanting and that type of thing. And the idea is to try to get plants that utilize the garden space in 
in different areas. Uh, so you might have a plant that grows tall that you'd pair with a plant that grows, has wide leaves, uh, or a plant that grows very slow combined with one that grows very fast that you can uh, grow and then harvest and uh, let the uh, one of the plants um, uh, continue on. Uh, but these are just a, a few of the, the combinations that uh, people have had success with. And again, the idea is to cover the soil surface or shade the soil surface with some type of plant, desirable plant leaf. Watering. Uh, some of those weed seeds we said were susceptible to drought. Uh, so when we're watering, if we just water where our desirable plants are and leave the, the vacant space in the gardens not watered, then that can uh, uh, cause the, the weed seeds not to germinate. And uh, when we think about watering, uh, our gardens need at least an inch of water a week. So if we had a 10 by 10 vegetable garden, that means you have, if you're lugging water, you're lugging 60 gallons of water out there a week. That's why it's good to have a hose set up and a sprinkler system, uh, you know, so you can uh, get that done a little bit easier. Uh, it's good to use some type of a rain gauge, you know, to, to be aware of how much uh, rainfall has fallen. Uh, if you do water and you're watering over the tops of the plants, uh, water in the morning, that's so the plants will have a chance, the leaves will have a chance to dry out uh, before evening. If you water in the evening all the time, then the leaves stay wet through the cool temperatures of the evening and uh, disease is more apt to develop. Uh, so water in the morning. And I have people that get uh, you know, they say, well, occasionally, you know, they have to come home and, and the leaves are wilted and, and well, that's okay to, to water then, but just don't make a common practice of it. Using mulches uh, will help uh, conserve the moisture and also uh, shade the soil so the weed seeds don't uh, grow. Uh, trickle irrigation, uh, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, those are tubes that are under the black plastic mulch. Uh, so it's conserving the water, the water that we're spreading near the plants is not evaporating uh, and we're not uh, watering the alleyways where the weeds might be growing. I mentioned flaming. And uh, a lot of times people think, well, there, this is going to be the answer. I'm going to have a fun time playing with flames and all that type of thing. Get your butane torch out. Uh, but it's only effective on weeds that are less than two inches tall. Uh, and you have to be really careful that there's no other flammable materials. Uh, I heard, uh, oh, is there a question? No, no, we're good now, laughing. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I, I did hear a story about somebody that was out uh, flaming and they had a strawberry patch and they had mulched it with straw mulch. And they saw some weeds in the springtime. So they thought, oh, darn it, uh, or somebody had told them they have to get them when they're only two inches tall. Well, they went out and they were trying to get the, the little weed seedlings and they caught the straw on fire and uh, all their straw burned up and they burned up their strawberry plants. So be very careful if you use this technique. Cultivation, and it can be, People cultivation, animal cultivation, uh, or uh, mechanical. Um, hand pulling, hoeing, that's been around, I think, ever since we've had gardens. Uh, we've used animal power for, for years and years. Uh, and the uh, plow and the harrow has, has, uh, was the, the typical way that we cultivated soil many years ago. Then, then we got into powder power rotary tillers. But when we're cultivating, it's important uh, that once you, you can do one deep cultivation in the springtime before you're, you're planting your vegetable gardens, and then all the other cultivations need to be very shallow uh, so you're not bringing up new weed seeds. 
the picture down at the lower uh, right shows uh, when you're using a hoe, just barely scrape uh, the soil surface. You don't want to get down below an inch. Get down below an inch of soil, you're bringing up more weed seeds. And that goes for, for rotary, rotary tillers too. Uh, you don't want to go, uh, once you do your initial tillage, all subsequent tillage in the summer should be less than an inch deep. And just so you know, from the inventors of Roomba comes turtle. And I see I've spelled it differently and I'm, I'm forgetting, I, I think it's T-E-R-T-I-L-L-E. Uh, but for some reason, it looked like a turtle to me. And when I made this slide, it's like turtle, <laughs> turtle. <laughs> But at the University of Maine, uh, the researchers have done uh, a little demonstration and that chart shows you after five days, uh, they actually go out and they count like the number of mustard plants that are out there. And uh, so after a, a couple of days, the, the turtle was able to control the, the mustard plants <clears throat> within the, their little quadrant that they had them, them uh, highlighted in, or corralled in. Uh, but I thought that that was an interesting type of uh, uh, mechanism that's available now. You'd have to have the right place, I'm sure. And it's not. And your your desirable crop needs to be big enough that it's not going to go in there and and till it up. And that's your true. weed crop exactly. needs to be small enough that it can control it. So it's not perfect, but it's kind of neat. And at the university, they also have this website that you can go to, and they have all these different types of hand hose. And they went through one year, and they showed you how the action of that hoe looked, hoeing up weeds around desirable plants. And you can see, you know, it's it's less than a minute showing you the the different actions of the of the hose, but it's it's kind of neat if you want to. Uh, Look at a new type of uh, hoe or new, you know, new type of hand implement. This might be a, a place to go and, and get some ideas. Now, when I uh, many years ago, one of my colleagues, uh, Gleason Gray, coined the term recreational rototilling. And when I say that word, you'll know exactly what I mean. And these walk behind tillers, uh, they're so easy to use. And they leave the garden bed so nice and it looks so beautiful that not only do we do it once in the springtime when we initially open up the garden, but a lot of people like to go out weekly and they like to put it in deep. They like to have, make it go down really deep and have that beautiful looking and smelling uh, uh, garden soil. Uh, the trouble is that's where you're ruining the soil structure. You're making it absolutely powder, power. And as a garden club, I'm sure you've had some soil talks and they talk, talked about the soil peds. You break up the soil peds and then you just have just very fine soils. And when it rains, it will crust over. And once it crusts over the water, when it rains again, the water is not going to seep down in the soil. You can also develop a plow layer so it will, the moisture will only go down a, the, the depth that you're tilling continuously and uh, you're not going to get good utilization of uh, moisture. So you could use this type of tiller if you set it to only go less than an inch, but I'm not sure people can uh, could tolerate that. And that this other tiller is one of those really fast um, tillers and it, it goes along and it stirs the soil and I if you could get it to just go an inch deep it would be okay but boy the temptation to go deeper and pull up all the weed seeds is uh, might be too tempting. I mentioned cover crops. Uh, cover crops is a good way to get nutrients into the soil and to try to break insect cycles and weed cycles. <clears throat> And it gives us, uh, you can grow them at different times of the year uh, and uh, till them in at different times of the year. So we'll go through a few uh, cover crops and green manures. 
A cover crop is a crop that we're going to leave in the soil over the winter to hold the soil in place so it isn't eroded either by wind or water. Uh, it can add significant organic matter. Uh, it should be easily incorporated into the soil and it will should outcompete the weeds. And one common cover crop that we can use are oats. Uh, if you plant them too early, uh, then they may go to seed and then you'll have oat seed uh, out there. But if you plant them mid-August to early September, they'll, they'll come up. They won't get to this stage. They'll just be leaves. <clears throat> and they're not winter hardy, so they will die back. And then in the springtime, they're super easy to incorporate into the soil. Summer green manure crops. Uh, are ones that we can grow during the summer in areas of the garden that we're uh, saving maybe for later vegetable planting or uh, you know we, we harvested an early crop. Uh, it adds organic matter, adds nitrogen, and again, smothering weeds. And on the right side of that uh, picture is uh, a small field of buckwheat. And uh, this is a little bit closer up picture of the buckwheat. And you can plant it anytime, it comes up very quickly. It, it does have a lot of water, so it doesn't produce much organic matter, but it covers the soil, prevents other uh, weeds from growing until uh, you have a, a chance to put in your desirable uh, uh, crop. A living mulch, if you have, this is a, a vineyard, uh, you can have a, a planting with annual or perennial desirable crop. Uh, and this is actually uh, annual or perennial ryegrass uh, that we use for our lawns. So how do you plant cover crops? And I'm just looking at the time here. I'll, I'll try to step it up a little bit. Uh, you can spread it with a spreader, mechanical spreader, or just spread it. We used to call it like uh, feeding the chickens. Uh, you spread it out, uh, rake it in a little bit. Uh, you can see that's a, a quarter. Uh, showing the seeds uh, around that quarter, uh, and that's um, oat seed. Um, if you firm the soil bed, the cover crop will come up better. Another uh, weed control method is mulching. And I mentioned it can uh, prevent soil moisture from evaporating. It uh, prevents the weeds from germinating. It can insulate uh, the soil from temperature exposure, temperature extremes. Uh, and splashing, if you have bare soil, sometimes soil will splash up on the plants and can cause disease. So if you have a mulch covering it, it prevents that. Uh, so it prevents soil crusting and uh, erosion too. Uh, and if you use organic mulches, uh, they do reduce, release nutrients very slowly. But with organic mulches, um, the reason that they're emitting nutrients slowly is they're slowly breaking down that carbon that's in the mulch. And the way it does it, it pulls nitrogen out of the soil. So you need to be very aware of that. And if you notice your desirable plants are getting a little yellowy, uh, you may need to add some uh, nitrogen, a nitrogen source. Uh, but these are a list of the types of uh, mulching materials that you can use. Uh, I would caution on grass clippings. Sometimes if you use them too thickly, they get kind of slimy and uh, uh, everything. So you want to use just a thin layer of grass clippings until they get dried out. There are some cautions. Uh, you know, we tell you to put down an organic mulch to prevent the weeds from growing. And then you get slugs in your, your plants. You say, what can I do to get rid of the slugs? And we'll tell you to take away the mulch. Uh, you know, so it's like darned if you do, darned if you don't. Uh, but they can attract some pests. Uh, and um, I mentioned the, the de undecomposed organic mulch can pull nitrogen from the soil. We used to have trouble with sour mulch. Uh, the uh, sawmills would have these huge uh, two-story sawdust piles. And uh, a gardener would go in and, and pull out uh, a bunch of of uh, sawdust to put on their garden. Uh, if you've got it in an area that 
uh, didn't have air in, you know, in the center of the pile, it could have decomposed anaerobically. And so it developed acids and that acid could burn your plants. Uh, and you, but you can tell if it's, if you have that situation by just smelling it. But because we use um, the uh, sawdust for uh, biomass boilers, uh, that tends to not be so much of a problem nowadays. Did you know that there are different types of plastics? Uh, we use clear plastic when we wanna heat the soil. Uh, we use black plastic when we wanna prevent weeds from germinating to prevent the sun from striking the soil surface. But there's also infrared transmitting uh, plastics that will heat the soil and also prevent the weeds from growing. Um, there are also different, they've done research on different colors of mulch and some colors sometimes will drive away uh, insects. Uh, reflective uh, mulches will also drive away insects, some insects, not all. And uh, I was gonna, oops, oops, oops. I was gonna say, um, these are the types of uh, plastic mulches that we use with the plants growing. There's another use for plastics that we use is called tarping. And uh, we started by saying, well, we can solarize the soil surface with a clear plastic tarp uh, and you seal around the edges. And it, what it's doing, it's heating up the soil to the point that it kills the weed seeds and will kill some diseases. The trouble is we have to have the right weather to, for that to happen. Uh, at the University of Maine, they found out that a black uh, tarp uh, could do a similar type of thing. Uh, it wasn't as dependent on weather. It blocks out the sunlight, prevents photosynthesis. It's called oculation instead of solarization. And it will uh, control the, the weeds, uh, but it's less dependent on the weather. We have no-till gardening. Uh, we actually have a book in our uh, publications catalog called Weedless Gardening gardening by Dr. Lee Reich. And uh, what it is, you, you mow the grass very close, you put down layers of cardboard and newspaper, uh, a layer of organic mulch, and you just repeat it. Uh, you can irrigate regularly. And usually you set this up in the fall, and then by the springtime, you'll have uh, something to, that you can plant in. The trouble with this and with uh, straw bale gardening, uh, I tried it. I tried the straw bale gardening, uh, I had quack grass. And we mentioned the quack grass uh, spreads by underground rhizomes and it just spread right through the, the whole thing. So then I had a mound of quack grass instead of just a flat area of quack grass. Uh, we have uh, biological controls, uh, but it's, they're only against certain uh, plants and it's not a widespread thing. So a home gardener, this isn't gonna be your answer. Uh, some home gardeners are thinking about herbicides. There are some concerns uh, because a, a home garden has several different types of plants. There's a uh, risk of drift uh, and your soil application is not as uniform as a, a farmer can get with a tractor. Uh, and a lot of the herbicides are sold in really big quantities. That being said, there are some herbicides uh, that a home gardener can use. These are some of them. Uh, and just to remind you, a herbicide is a pesticide. A pesticide is anything that kills or mitigates a pest. Not all pesticides are herbicides, but all herbicides are pesticides. Uh, Pre-emergent herbicides control the seed, the weed seed before it comes up. Uh, the post-emergent herbicides kill the plant, the seedling. Uh, the post-emergent systemic goes into the green part of the plant, soaks down in and kills the roots. Um, <clears throat> and if you plan to use a herbicide in a home garden, again, identify your pest, know that they're a problem, try other non-chemical controls, then read and follow the label directions. Timing is important. And then evaluate how did it do and uh, figure out what you're going to do next. And these are some more uh, weed control resources that I'll send along. And there's my contact information. 
how to do three minutes. <laughs> we have. Okay, shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, why don't you stop sharing uh, the the uh, the presentation will get posted on the library YouTube site eventually, so that you can go in and find all the information the great information she's put up here. And I think we have time for a few questions and Barbara's gonna manage that part. If you're on line and you want to ask a question, can you use the raise hand function down under reactions because that will bring you up to the top so we can see you. Thank you. Okay, questions here, March. I'm wondering if um, Donna would recommend putting weeds in your compost. Can you could you would I recommend that? I heard that. Would okay. I recommend putting weeds in your compost? If they're in seed, if they're spewing out seeds, I might be a little cautious of that. Uh, if you're a super duper composter and you know that all of your compost is going to be raised up to 140 degrees, you know, if you're very confident. Uh, you know, then you can uh, go ahead and chop them up. I'd chop them up maybe if they're that big. Uh, but make sure you have a robust compost pile. Yes, I get, I get it. Yeah. Uh, Deb, since you're the one that has a question. Deb Smith, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Right. Um, I wonder if you can tell me about um, valerian, if that's um, perennial. Biennial, do you have to pull up the roots in order to eliminate it, or can you chop it down and let it die off? Well, there. I have to admit something to folks. Uh, my education at the University of Maine was in animal science, and I've <laughs> learned all of this gardening stuff through 40 years of extension. And I have learned that when I don't know the answer, I better say, I'm not sure. And the thing is, there a lot of different types of plants have annual forms and perennial forms. And what I'd suggest is going uh, and seeing which valerian you've got. And I, I believe it's an invasive plant, but I might be wrong. <laughs> and uh, But I go to one of those resources that I've uh, cited, and that's where they'll tell you, uh, you know, is it an annual? Is it a perennial? Uh, and how is it spreading? Uh, and and that's why I use those resources all the time. I go to iBotany. That's the first place you should go when, when we get done. Any questions here? I think I think that's it. I oh, think there are yeah. no hands in the chat. So we'll say thank you and give another round of applause. Okay, and I'll, I'll send this uh, um, information to the folks that have your emails in the link. I've hopefully saved that chat. Uh, so I'll have your email. And uh, Barb, I'll send it to you. And I think I've got Susan's email too. And uh, you can share with the, the other folks that are in the room there. Yes, that'll be fun. Stop. Okay, then. Well, I hope you folks have a good day. It's nice and sunny here in Bangor. Okay, wait till it's done. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Blackhawk. Yeah. It's interesting. Great. It's interesting. Yeah.